I previously did a video on the bone health benefits of melatonin, and it created some controversy. I was accused of cherry picking the evidence and only presenting the positive studies on this particular product, and there was some suggestion that I had a financial motive at play. Two big issues here. First, there is a study that I didn't include with the negative perspective of melatonin and fracture. And second, if I have a financial relationship any any company or product, I promise I will disclose that openly. I do not have any with any melatonin supplements that I'm aware of. What I'd love to show you is that there is a dark side of melatonin in the research, and I will show you what this one particular study shows. I'm also going to show you why I didn't bother to show it to you in the first place. I'll also review the highlights of the positives from my first video on this topic, so if you'd like to see that video, you can do so here. I'll also give you an update on how we are using these products, specifically melatonin in our practice, and what our experience has been in our Platinum Experience program. But here's a question for you. If you're using melatonin and have a story to share, I wanna hear about it in a comment on YouTube. So a little background on melatonin. For those that aren't familiar with what this supplement really is, it's a hormone that's primarily produced by the pineal gland in the brain. It plays a crucial role in regulating the body's circadian rhythm, that sleep-awake cycle that drives us to go to sleep at night, wake up in the morning. Its production increases in response to darkness. That's one of the reasons why I have a hard time going to sleep if you're in a studio like this with bright UV light. And it does help to promote sleep, which is why we encourage darkening our lights at night, trying to follow the circadian rhythm of the sun. The production decreases as the sun starts to come up, um, and then you get the, those morning UV rays from the sun and it'll actually decrease your pineal gland. will see that as it comes in through your eyes and then you'll stop making melatonin. So it's just really cool cyclic back and forth production by the pineal gland based on the circadian rhythm of the environment around you. So melatonin has various impacts on the, both the brain and the body. In the brain, again, it helps to regulate that sleep pattern, but also has a significant impact on mood. It also seems to have some antioxidant properties, so it can provide neuroprotective effects. It can potentially guard against neurodegenerative conditions, which is pretty cool. Beyond the brain, melatonin also influences immune function, so it acts within our immune system. It has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. It's also been studied for its role in cancer prevention as it has some impact on the processes involved in cell proliferation. Research isn't super clear on that side. The influence of melatonin extends to various physiologic processes, making it really important as a hormone for both sleep regulation and broader health maintenance overall. So in my last video, I pulled these two studies. So one of these studies was a randomized control trial of 81 participants, 12 months of data comparing melatonin to placebo. Pretty cool. They used doses of both one milligrams and three milligrams. And what they saw is that there was a linear increase in bone mineral density over time. Now the one milligram group, not that much, less than 1%, but the three milligram group was actually over 2% over the course of 12 months. That's pretty good. Now, from a statistical perspective, they had to break down cortical versus trabecular bone, which is always kind of a questionable thing to do in the research, but at least they're showing that it has an impact on some, some measure of bone. And so really statistically, only the trabecular bone or the spongy bone on the inside, particularly gonna see this in the spine, had a bigger impact than did the cortical bone, the harder bone on the outside. They also measured my two favorite bone turnover markers, the P1MP and the CTX. And we did see that CTX dropped not by a lot, by 10%, and P1 and P didn't really go up that much, but the ratio would have improved, and you've heard me talk about that ratio as well. Now, a second but smaller study looked at melatonin in addition to strontium, vitamin D, vitamin K2, over the course of 12 months. So they called this the MSDK intervention, and they showed pretty significant improvement in spine and femoral neck bone mineral density, and also sleep, which you would kind of expect, although not everybody responds well to melatonin for sleep. The challenge here is that what, what was the most impactful component of that MSDK intervention? Was it the melatonin, the strontium, the vitamin D, or the vitamin K2? So, you know, we would generally use all these things together anyway, and we actually do use these sometimes together. So melatonin as a part of that certainly seemed to be beneficial, but again, there was no placebo group, or there was no SDK, in other words, strontium, D, and K, without the melatonin to compare to. So really hard to know what the impact of melatonin was in that study. So that all sounds pretty positive, but what a lot of the YouTube comments pointed out to me is that there is a large study that shows that in the United Kingdom, at least, that prescriptions for melatonin were associated with a significantly increased fracture risk. How is that possible? It certainly sounds alarming. So let's dig into that claim and let's dig into that study. 
Before we do that though, if you're having a hard time figuring out how to put all this together, consider joining me for my free masterclass. This is a course that we run every one to two weeks. It's live, it's me talking about osteoporosis, how we build programs and answering questions for about 15 minutes. So if that sounds like something that would be helpful for you, again, totally free, look for the link in the description on YouTube, or you can go to optimalhumanhealth.com and look for the link there as well. All right, so here's the study that people were talking about. So this is a study, again, it was observational. It was done in the United Kingdom, but it was pretty big. Their goal was to look at prescriptions of these, the, the group of drugs called the hypnotic benzodiazepines. So that's temazepam, nitrazepam, and then the Z drugs, which are zolpidem and zolpiclone. Uh, I think only zolpidem is available in the US. And then they want to compare that to melatonin and then look at the risk of fracture over time. Okay, so now we're dealing with a population that's being prescribed to something in England, one of these three drugs, and then whether or not they have a fracture over time. Okay, so from a design perspective, this is retrospective, meaning that we're looking, we're grabbing a data set, and we're looking backwards in time to see what happened with the people that were prescribed something versus not. This was done over the course of a five-year group. So that included, let's see, 1,377 patients aged 45 and older that were prescribed melatonin, 880 in the other drug group, and almost 3,000 in the uh, control group. So that's a lot of people. And so this is potentially a powerful study. So let's look and see what happened. So what happened was there was a 90% increase in the risk of fracture for those that were prescribed melatonin. Well, that's pretty alarming. You compare that to the other drug groups, and there was a 70% for one drug group and over 100% for the Z drug group. So that's, you know, it's a lot, that's a big uh, increase in risk. So this is something you could say, oh my gosh, man, I don't want to take the supplement. But you really have to understand statistics to be able to break this down. So when you look at this, what you can see is that they adjusted based off of all of their, you know, the, the attempt to try to adjust for other you know, comorbidities, making essentially the, the control group look more like the intervention group. And this is something that's really hard to do in an observational study. They attempt to do it, and I totally get that. But when they adjusted for 26 covariates, what they found is that the increased risk was actually by 44% for melatonin, not 90% but I would argue 44% increased risk still sounds pretty bad. Now, the other component about statistics that you need to understand is that when there is a very wide, what's called confidence interval, what you'll find is that it, the wide confidence interval means that, that there is potentially a high risk, but also potentially a low risk. And if that confidence interval actually crosses over the baseline, which is one, then we can't say that that change is actually statistically significant. And what you see here in the adjusted for covariate hazard ratio is that that 1.44 or 44% increase in risk barely crosses the, the one line. And so this is barely statistically significant, but it does reach statistical significance. The question is, is, is it actually clinically relevant? And that's a totally different question. So a couple other things that they pointed out in this study is that the increased fracture risk was noted only in patients that had three or more prescriptions. So this was something that was taken in theory over time. And the average time to fracture was around one year with no real significant difference between the drug groups. So what they concluded is that melatonin in one of the drug classes was associated with a higher risk of fracture in this uh, patient population. And they were concerned about potentially the safety profile of these drugs, particularly around melatonin, because it was so abundant. So you might be asking yourself, man, that sort of sounds pretty relevant, Dr. Doug. Why didn't you include this in the first place? Well, here's the thing. So when you're looking at studies and you're trying to figure out you know which of these things are clinically relevant you really have to take into account the strength of the study design whenever we're looking at retrospective cohort studies these are good tools to look for associations and we see this all the time particularly in nutrition research people like to point out these these associations but there are entire websites dedicated to funny associations like the stork population and birth rates in humans and, and like the funny things go on and on and on because association or correlation does not equal causation. And we have to remember that when we look at something that is an association, it really should only be used as a tool to then develop a hypothesis. And that hypothesis should then be used to perform a, a forward facing or a randomized control trial that is prospective in nature. And obviously we have that and those other studies that I pointed out, and not only did their bone marrow density go up, but their fracture risk likely did not. It, they didn't do it long enough to see a reduction in fracture risk, but they also weren't even measuring that. So I think it's this is a good study to look for a potential hypothesis, but there's no reason why the melatonin would 
increase their risk of fracture. And so I wouldn't even consider it as a, a reasonable thing to point out to you because it's just going to make things more confusing when it comes to what tools do I want to use to try to build up my own bone health program. I think a nice way to look at this study too is actually really similar to some of the studies that show an increase in risk of heart attack in men taking testosterone. So there are some studies that were published that caused a lot of concern around testosterone and heart attack because if you look at the same design, which is prescriptions written for a drug, it doesn't actually mean that that person took that drug. And so then you have to ask yourself, well, why would a doctor prescribe melatonin instead of a pharmaceutical for a patient? And here's my thought, which is, that if you are seeing a, a group of patients and they're suffering from insomnia and you wanted to pick the least concerning or impactful or least side effect drug, probably for the sickest patients, you're gonna use melatonin over the other drugs. Now, I know they tried to adjust for these variables, but again, this is hard to do in a retrospective study. So I think one of the things we might be seeing here is that the sickest population is going to be prescribed the melatonin because they don't wanna expose them to the potential risks of these other pharmaceuticals. So now you're looking at a sicker population compared to controls, and you're gonna see a potential risk of fracture. The other thing to consider here too is that when you look at the time to fracture of around a year, Again, physiologically, why would melatonin increase your risk of fracture? It doesn't, there's, no, there's no physiologic pathway that makes sense from a bone perspective as to why you would potentially lose bone or increase your risk of fracture from a bone perspective unless you were having a side effect from the drug and you felt you know, dizzy or, or off balance or you got out of bed and you were in a stupor and you, and you fell and you broke your hip. That's kind of a different issue and people are going to need to take the, the dose of the drug that works well for them. So all that taken into account, I don't think that this study is going to deter me from using melatonin. We still offer it to our patients. We ask about our patient's sleep. We have a whole sleep program that we have built in because we really want to optimize sleep. I think that's really important. Not everybody does well with melatonin though. And I think that's really important to understand as well is that just because something works according to a study, if it doesn't work for you, it's probably not a good thing for you to do. And so for people that have the sort of the reciprocal response, they sort of get you know alerted or they get stimulated by melatonin, we just tell them not to take it. We've got tons of tools. So we don't end up using that. In our practice, when we use it, we're gonna use around a three milligram dose and we like liposomal formulations because they're more quickly absorbed. So this was kind of a refute to some of the comments I got on YouTube, which we love by the way, but happy to bring this one forward. If you wanna see the original melatonin video, you can see that here. If you wanna see my other newly updated supplement video for 2024, you can see that down here. And remember please, that osteoporosis isn't the end but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. And I'll see you in the next video.